Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside the PSC, where we take a look at the inner workings of the Public Service Commission of West Virginia. I'm your co-host for the day, Alexis Weimer, filling in for the lovely Karen Hall who couldn't be here. And we have an excellent guest today, very highly valued and respected director of the Consumer Advocate Division of the Public Service Commission of West Virginia. But before we get into our interview, we're going to take a quick break to take a look at one of Chairman Charlotte Lane's videos about a changing world. Hello, I'm Charlotte Lane, Chairman of the West Virginia Public Service Commission. When I was a young girl growing up in Pleasance County, my greatest fear was getting stung by a bee. That world seemed simpler, slower, and a lot safer. But even before the turn of the century, things took a turn for the worse. Today we are aware of every danger, every terrorist act, and every other horrible thing going on. Whether the world really is a lot more dangerous than it was back then or just more aware of things, our leadership at the state and national levels certainly think that it is. And we at the Public Service Commission of West Virginia are paying much more attention to the security of the utility systems that serve you. The systems we refer to as infrastructure are the building blocks that power the services that keep us comfortable at home and allow us to work in our offices. The utilities that provide our critical infrastructure services have to be on high alert these days to possible threats to their security and their ability to provide those services. At one time, terrorist acts seemed remote to West Virginia. They happened in the big cities, not here. But the Oklahoma City bombing proved that wasn't so. Massacres in small towns across the nation underscore the sad fact that these things can happen, even in the Mountain State. Our legislature passed the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act this year to beef up security of these critical infrastructure points to expand the facilities and structures that fall under the law and to enhance penalties for dealing with those matters. We at the Public Service Commission welcome these changes and we will do all we can to keep our utilities safe. And we're back. I love watching the chairman's video. She provides a lot of really thoughtful insight into what goes on within the commission. Now we'll jump right into the nitty gritty. We're here with Mr. Robert Williams, the director of the Consumer Advocate Division. I'm sure a lot of people have questions about what exactly the Consumer Advocates and Advocate Division is and what it does. Could you provide us a little bit of information into its essential purpose? Sure, Alexis. The Consumer Advocate Division is the party participating in rate cases that's designed to represent the interests of residential rate payers. If you look at any of the cases online or follow them, usually you'll have a set of people that are intervening to represent various interests. So you'll have uh, the industrial customers will have their own attorneys. You'll see the cold association involved with their attorneys. You'll have other people who have representation and they're all interested in pursuing the interests of their target group. The commission staff is there to represent the overall interest. They're not necessarily looking at one party over the other. The Consumer Advocate Division was created back in 1980 mm. and was established in 81 to um, represent the interest primarily of residential consumers but we can also represent other ratepayer interests as well. That's very interesting. And I know the Consumer Advocate Division is part of the PSC, but they're not really within the PSC. You guys have your whole own building and everything. Can you explain the reason behind that? We don't have our own building. We've got a partial floor on okay. the building. Okay. But we have not been housed with the commission from the beginning, and that's by design. Okay. The commission put out a general order when it created it in 1980. As part of their structure, they made it clear that the consumer advocate was to have its own budget. Mm -hmm. It was to have its own ability to hire and fire people within its division. Okay. And we would have autonomy to be able to appeal commission orders if we didn't like the outcome of it. Oh, okay. That's not something that other people working at the commission can do. Right. Okay, that's cool. So what are some of the requirements to necessarily be a consumer advocate? Um, by statute, um, it's it's another director of the division. So I'm director of a division at the PSC. Mm -hmm. So I have to meet the qualifications of a director. Uh, that can be an attorney. It can be somebody with um, 
financial or economic background. It can be an engineer. And the more experience you have, uh, either in a regulatory field, working for a regulated utility, working for a regulatory agency, or uh, have other experience working in that, uh, makes you more qualified to be there. You can have up to seven years of experience as a minimum qualification and ideally some supervisory experience mm, as well. That sounds like a very rewarding position for sure. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you were doing before you became the director of the Consumer Advocate Division? Well, I first went to um, engineering school before I went to law school. Okay. So I was planning on being an attorney all along, but I was good at math and science. So I got my engineering degree at Virginia Tech and got a law degree at Wake Forest University. When I first came out of school, I was looking for a job in, back in West Virginia. I grew up in West Virginia. I returned back. And um, the chairman was looking for a uh, law clerk at that time. And so I interviewed and was started out first as a commission law clerk. I worked at the commission for a while as a staff attorney, then as an administrative law judge, okay. and then deputy chief administrative law judge. Then I left the commission for a while. I've worked as a, a staff attorney with the... Um, legislature for several years handling issues including the PSC type of um, legislation is pending and I returned to the Commission in 2021 for a vacancy for the Consumer Advocate Division and I luckily was chosen for that. That's awesome. You sound like you have quite an impressive background, engineering and law school. Wow, very admirable. So can you tell us a little bit about the cases that you all uh, pursue throughout the Commission? What is the criteria for you all to step in? Well, the consumer advocate doesn't have to be involved in all cases, but okay. we try to intervene in things that are going to have a significant impact on residential customers, okay. so, particularly the rate cases. But we have been involved in general investigations, uh, like the recent fire hydrant general investigation establishing rules to protect the consumer interests mm -hmm. in having working fire hydrants in their communities. We have uh, also intervened in rate cases, but we're kind of a small group, so we can't be in every case. Right. But we have to decide how we're going to apply our resources. But all the major rate cases we're involved in, uh, there's several cases you, that people are aware of. We just see the rate increments going up. Mm -hmm. We try to be involved in those cases, um, purchase power cases, purchase gas cases, all those type of things we're regularly involved in. And we're also involved in all the distressed utility filings that have a potential rate impact as well on okay. consumers. Okay, sounds like you guys stay pretty busy over there. We do. So you also intervene in cases that involve federal agencies, such as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. What is your involvement there? We usually are doing that in concert with other states as well. Um, we're, we're members as well of the um, consumer advocates of PJM states and also with uh, NASUCA, which is the National Association of State Consumer Advocates. We communicate with each other about issues that are, we have in common, and a lot of times we'll share resources and intervene together or support different appeals that are pending in front of the FERC. We're going to take a quick break and watch a video about electricity's shocking truth with our lovely chairman, Ms. Charlotte Lane. Hello, I'm Charlotte Lane, chairman of the West Virginia Public Service Commission. A dear friend of mine is fond of telling the story about the day he learned about electricity. Lots of us are curious, perhaps overly so, of this mysteriously powerful force that flows through wires and then lights and heats and cools our homes, cooks our food, and powers so many things we rely on. My friend thought sneaking up on a smiley-faced outlet in his home and poking a fork into it would be a smashing idea. And so it proved. He was blown, literally, back. And I have to imagine his hair curled with little wisps of smoke. All of us here at the Public Service Commission want to remind you not to mess with electricity. It is a life-giving force, but it is also extremely dangerous when used wrongly. My friend was very young when he suffered a mild shock and learned a lesson. It is a lesson I hope most people will take to heart without getting a shock or burn, or having something more serious happen. Electricity is not something ever to be played with. 
If you see an open outlet, don't try to fix it. If you are outside and see a dangling power line or, goodness forbid, one that is sparkling, don't try to tackle that problem yourself. Call the power company or call 911. They are the professionals. You are not and we don't want you to try. All sorts of potentially dangerous situations exist where electricity power is concerned. Don't be one of the people who are hurt or worse who become statistics. We always need your help whenever you see something you know is not right. Please call for help. Electricity is a powerful tool for good, and when handled correctly, it makes our lives so much easier. But it also must be respected as the force of nature that it is. Don't be like my friend. If you need repairs, put down the fork and call an electrician. And we're back with another great video from our chairman. Now, I know we talk a lot about the legal stuff, but what necessarily does it mean to intervene in a case? Intervention is a state of art where you're wanting to, there's some parties that are there automatically, and the rest of them have to get permission to participate. So what you do is when, once the case is pending, you have the utilities file a rate case. If a party has interest in that, they do what they call a motion to intervene. Okay. And a motion to intervene says, we want to be involved in this case and here's our interest. Mm -hmm. Not just anybody can walk in saying, this is interesting to me, you got to say what you have at risk. Mm -hmm. Like this, affecting, this is affecting my business, this is affecting my personal utility rates, and uh, this is, as a class, we have this interest as a group when we're coming in. Okay. So we're coming in when we're saying we're intervening, we're saying we're here pursuant to our statutory authority to represent the interests of residential consumers. In this case, we think their case, their interests are affected by this. Mm. Okay, okay. So kind of to rewind back where we were, there's another group that participates, well you all participate in conferences and activities involving the PJM Regional Transmission Organization. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, PJM is um, a group that is overseeing all the grid for the electric utility system. So they make sure that the resources coming from various states and various plants are all blended in and mixed well and meet the needs of consumers. And they can have, um, like electricity that's being generated in West Virginia can also be used in Pennsylvania, can be used in Maryland, can be sent somewhere else, and that's making sure that all the needs of a multi-state area are met. PJM is the entity that basically is managing that flow of energy. They're not the ones generating it, they're managing the flow going from one place to another. And they are charging rates and they set basically a market rate for using those different assets and that can be a good part of a utility bill to get it passed on. Public Service Commission only has really jurisdiction to impact a part of the costs that are assumed by residential rate payers. A lot of it's coming from the providers of energy and the management of the PJM this deciding how much is charged. That's probably about two thirds of your bill is coming from the transmission costs that are being passed through by PJM. So you guys are involved in an awful lot. Um, how many people and positions are there within the Consumer Advocate Division and what are their roles? We currently have nine positions. I have three attorneys under me that uh, help us intervene in cases. We also regularly would hire outside consultants to assist us in cases. So we have national experts that come in and will help us with the technical issues that come in. Um, they can be accountants, uh, finance people, people that can do class cost of service studies that are fairly complex issues. Um, we also have our own internal staff and it, the other people would be consisting of technical staff that can also do financial analysis. Everybody that I have that is a non-attorney would be expected to be able to testify in cases as needed. So ideally the type of people we have are people that can understand complex issues. Mm -hmm. They're good with numbers. They don't mind digging into the weeds on some of these cases, and they can explain their positions and advocate for them on the stand. So they would do that through written testimony and also oral testimony. 
Nice, nice. So we'll get into the nitty gritty. I know that you guys are involved in a lot of utility rate cases. And here lately it seems like electric water and gas rates seem to go up and up and up. Um, and I know, again, the Consumer Advocate Division intervenes in a lot of those rate cases. Mm -hmm. How do you approach those cases? Um, in all those cases, the commission we know has to balance the total record as to, that comes before it in a case. So it can't just be this costs too much, we can't afford this. That carries some weight, but we really have to be able to develop numbers to give them reasons to say no mm. to certain items. So what we do is we we have we do audits of the utility filing. We have interrogatories. We ask a lot of questions about what they filed. If we think some of the expenses might be something that they had in that one year we're looking at, but shouldn't be recurring. We're not trying. We said, well, that shouldn't be used for setting your rates later on. We can have disputes about how the cost should be shared or allocated between the various customer classes. So we're saying residential customers are paying too much for this. Industrial customers aren't paying their fair share of it. Um, but we have to have studies to support that. And so that's why we have technical experts come in to analyze the filing, come up with their own proposals of what they think is reasonable and appropriate. If there's any expenses that we think are unreasonable or were imprudently incurred, we can say that shouldn't be allowed for rate-making purposes. Mm -hmm. And it gets into a line-by-line -line item of what we have in dispute. And so by the time we filed our testimony, we'll have a base number that we think is supported by the company's filing compared to what staff has filed and what the other parties have filed. Okay. And then we, the case is really presenting that and um, seeing if we can either come to an agreement by stipulation or if not, we're fully litigating that case. So have you had much success in your attempts to mitigate higher rate cases? We have had some attempts and it's different on how we have cases. When I first came to the commission, there was really maybe like for electric and gas, there were just two cases a year at most. You would have the fuel costs done every year and that would be something that could go up and down as gas prices go up. Mm. You know, that might have to go up to cover the cost of gas. As it goes down, it would be reduced. And that's just flowing through a cost without giving the company any profit whatsoever. You're just saying this is how much they paid for their gas supply. They should be allowed to recover that from their customers. Right. The other major case would be like a base rate case like Appalachian Power Company's mm. just filed that a lot of people are upset about. Mm. Um, they actually haven't filed a case like that for several years, Wow! like pre-COVID. But in that case, you're looking at all the other operating expenses the company has. You're looking at the profit that it has, how much it pays its employees, how big a staff is, um, the cost of doing the day-to-day -day operations, the outside of just buying electricity or selling electricity from its plants. Um, all that would be taken care of in the base rate case. So that's a more complex case. A lot of the filings that have come in recently is people are seeing a lot of increments on their bills. Mm -hmm. And those increments are just certain individual line items. So like for Appalachian Power Company, if they had to do some environmental upgrades to their plants to be able to keep operating their plants to meet new federal standards, and it wasn't time to do a base rate case, they would file and get that increment approved, and then just the cost for doing that upgrade would be something that would be shared among the customers. So that's smaller rates. We're now having probably multiple filings each year, tracking wow. these different line items that they have, and uh, it requires a lot of cases but they're probably smaller increases at the time mm -hmm. than if they came in with a base rate case. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's actually very informative. Yeah. Um, is there a particular case that stands out in your mind as a good example of the work the Consumer Advocate Division does? Well, I think probably one that I could say that gives an example of how we've operated. When the company came in, uh, you remember a few years ago, gas prices shot up very highly. Mm. Um, that was during the, the Ukrainian war. 
Russia wasn't delivering things. Europe was looking for more energy sources. And their purchase of gas and coal from the United States actually caused our coal prices to go caused our gas prices to shoot up first, and then coal prices followed. Mm. All of a sudden, um, the gas plants didn't have enough gas to operate or they couldn't afford to operate, where PJM decided that that's not our most cost-effective source. Mm. We'd rather buy coal plant electricity. And that made the coal market constrained. And it turned out that Appalachian Power Company and Wheeling Power Company didn't have enough coal on the ground to be able to operate as plants and take advantage of that good market. We had a coal expert we brought in to provide testimony that said this was unreasonable. We thought that um, the coal should have been available to, uh, to operate that plant. And the cost of that from not being able to operate the plant was actually a very large expense to consumers. Instead of actually running the plants and making a profit, and selling at a good time, they had to turn around and buy energy from PJM to service customers at a much higher rate than what it would cost them to run the plants if they had the coal on the ground. Right. We um, would have argued saying that that should be something that should be more borne by the shareholders. We didn't have any control over that. Consumers shouldn't have to absorb those losses or those increased costs. We actually ended up having about two or three years of litigation on that uh, that just resolved last year. And in the meantime, there's about $585 million of expenses that the company didn't recoup from consumers. And ultimately, the commission disallowed $231 million of that. And the rest of it, in accordance with what we recommended, we said it should be spread over 10 years instead of recovering it all at once. Give them a small interest rate for carrying that, but consumers, instead of paying $350 million all at once, they're paying about $37 million a year over 10 years. Mm. So that's definitely got to go. So, so, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a win for us, but that's still in litigation. They've appealed that to the Supreme Court, mm. and we'll actually argue that on uh, September. Yeah, doing all that definitely has to come with a lot of challenges. Yes. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge and the most pressing issues behind the never-ending request for something like rate increases? Well, I'm looking to see how much time I have left because there's so much going on right now. But uh, in, a, in a word, it's really the cost of replacing infrastructure, almost regardless of what utility you're talking about. With... Um, Distressed utilities, when we're looking at that, a lot of those are aging systems that uh, they're, were originally built with grant money or low interest loans. As those systems age and you don't have the same level of money to support it, then they have to either let their system go into disrepair and distress, or they can find another way to meet their needs. Um, what we've ended up doing a lot of the distressed utility cases is you've had Western Americans saying, well, if nobody else is wanting them, maybe we can take it over and help them out. Mm -hmm. When you have that option, Western American gets put in a position where they have to pay back some of the loans because they're under federal monies that they're not eligible to receive. Or you can have something coming in where, um, with Western American, um, what we're trying to do if we can is trying to keep it with a public service district when possible or another entity that's still eligible to receive low interest grants and loans instead of having a private system take it over. Unless the legislature or somebody else provided a pot of money or a resource where the private companies could also borrow at low interest rates, that won't change. Mm. Um, but we, we would encourage the legislature to maybe consider ways of funding that because ultimately when a utility acquires something, it's not a private company putting up the money. Ultimately, the ratepayers had to pay for the cost of that upgrade. If you look back at Dave Ellis's presentation, and he did a good explanation of rate making, a lot of it depends on rate base. And rate base is determined by what the investment is that the company has made that they're allowed to earn a rate of return on. If we find a way to make that same improvement 
without having the company having to make that money investment. Mm -hmm. Or they can do it with low interest loans, or they can do it with even a grant. Then that's money the consumers don't have to come up with. It's either funded by taxpayer dollars or ratepayer dollars. It is not funded by private company dollars, mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, when you're looking at the electric field, um, with electric companies, the big challenge is the transition from uh, coal and gas burning plants to another form of energy. That's a transition we know is coming over time. We think has come prematurely for a lot of the coal plants. And a lot of the coal plants that we have in, that are operating now, that represents about $3 billion of investment by the companies. What that is, is that's in rate base for the companies. Whether those plants operate or not, rate payers are going to have to pay on that rate base. If you take it out of service or you stop using it before prematurely, they still have to pay for it. And then they got to pay for something else to generate the electricity. So we're saying while the coal plants are there, the, let's find a way to operate the coal plants most efficiently so we get the best bang for our buck on what we already have invested. Otherwise, ratepayers are paying for the past investment, and they're also paying for the next investment that's going to be replacing those plants. And that's just going to make things get worse. Mm, wow. So these are big things to worry about, and the transition is coming. Um, we did have, I think at the last hearing, we were talking about the PJM auction for capacity. Went up tenfold, recognizing that these plants have value, but you have to um, make sure that that, and until that's replaced, you could potentially have a shortfall of capacity, which means you can't keep your lights on, you can't meet all the needs that are coming up, and they're not building new capacity big enough or fast enough mm. to replace what's coming offline. Wow, yeah, well, it sounds like present time, you guys are definitely very busy with all of this going on, but I yes. think everybody at home can certainly say you are very well qualified and you have a great team behind you, so I'm sure we feel a lot better about having you on their side. Thank you. Um, so this will conclude this episode of Inside the PSC. Thank you very much, Robert, for being here. Thank it was you. very informative. I very much enjoyed it. Please tune in again next month for Inside the PSC, where we will take a look at the inner workings of the Public Service Commission of West Virginia.